Okay, so again, CNT, <laughs> CCAOM training video. Um, by a show of hands, how many students are entering into clinic? Okay, so what we're going to cover today um, is adjunct techniques in the acupuncture practice in relationship to CNT and clean needle technique and just safety and prevention of injuries. So we're going to start with the burns from moxibustion. So first things first, most important with your patient is take a adequate initial history. Taking an adequate initial history, um, you want to make sure you find out about neuropathy, any issues with sensation. Right? Obviously the patient needs to feel the sensations so that you know when to remove the moxibustion or if things are too hot. We already know you should stay in the room with the patient, so you're never going to leave the room while performing moxibustion. Shield the patient from ash. Different schools and different students do this differently using paper techniques, cardboard, foil, um, whichever way you choose, just make sure that if ash is to fall, that it's not going to land on the patient. Stay attentive. This refers to staying in the moment, making sure when you're treating a patient that you're present, that the patient's not chit-chatting, that you're not chit-chatting, that it's, the conversation is strictly limited and focused on the task that you're performing. Wash, hand, uh, wash any burns immediately with cool water. So our goal is to not burn the patient, but if you do burn the patient, putting cool water on the burn um, is, is best. And then you have to document any burns that do occur. And it's recommended that you document the diameter and the location. Um, avoiding moxibustion on somebody who is excessively sensitive. So if you're needling them or you're palpating them and they're ooh and ah and everything is tender and they're hypersensitive, you might want to avoid moxibustion. And then also avoid moxibustion on the face. Right? So let's look at some best practices for moxibustion. So you're going to wash your hands. There's got to be good ventilation in the room uh, or an air filter. Everything should be right next to your table. So when you're doing moxibustion, you don't want to have to run across the treatment room to get an extinguisher or to get a little bowl of water or an incense or a lighter. Have everything right next to you. A suitable ashtray. Lotion or lubricant. Here we use um, liniment, like a burn ointment. So anything that will hold the mox in place on the skin. Um, the liniment or burnt ointment is great because it also helps prevent the burn. Light the incense away from the patient. So again, just safety first. You're not going to be using a lighter and trying to light it near the patient. A cup of water nearby. Um, do not leave the patient unattended. So it's not like, oh, I have five minutes here or to this Moxa burns down, let me run to check the next patient, right? So staying in the room with the patient, staying attentive, we said that already. Um, prevent falling moxa and prevent falling ash. Right? So let's take a look at another way to warm the patient, which is using a heat lamp. Same as moxibustion, you're going to ask about neuropathy, stay in the room with the patient, stay attentive. Now you're dealing with a piece of equipment that you want to make sure stays dry and you want to make sure that it's functioning and that no parts are going to fall or lean towards the patient or burn the patient. You also have to consider keeping this away from combustible material, which includes the alcohol that's in the room. And again, you have to document the burns. How many inches away from the patient should the TDP lamp be or the infrared heat lamp? Does anybody know? Maybe 12 inches. 12 inches, right? So the answer is 12 inches. You have to be aware of patients that fall asleep, right? And you do not want to use this on children. So you just answered correctly, 12 inches away from the skin, a maximum of 10 to 15 minutes, and it's recommended that you stay with the patient just to monitor them and make sure that they don't get too hot and that nothing um, burns them. Let's take a look at cupping. So preventing adverse effects of cupping. Do not use with neuropathy. So again, an adequate history with the patient. Do not use with bleeding disorders. Your history should include medications, warfarin, coumadin, aspirin, stuff that'll be a blood thinner that could cause increased bruising or marks on the patient or bleeding. 
You're not going to cup over open lesions or over lesions. You want to inspect the skin and make sure it's clear. And in the middle there, that dot, not within 48 hours before or 24 hours after chemotherapy. Okay. Best practices of cupping. So you have to wash your hands. Clean the area that's going to be cupped. You're going to use the flame safely. Be very cautious. You have an open flame over a patient who might have hairspray. You might have linens in the room. There's alcohol. So be extra careful with that. A cup of water nearby. Stay attentive. Educate the patient about the marks. This is huge. Informed consent. Let them know what to expect, that they might have marks on their back. Right? Do they plan on going to the beach? Are they wearing a backless gown to the wedding this weekend? You want to make sure that they have um, knowledge of what could potentially happen here. You have to clean and then disinfect the cups before use. Cleaning the cups, you have to scrub them first to get any biomaterial off of them. And then you have to disinfect them um, in an FDA, EPA approved um, sanitizer. Do you think it has to be intermediate or high level? High level. Intermediate to high level is the answer. Right? For wet cupping, use gloves, eye protection, and sterile lancets. The lancets are going to be a single use. Right. Let's take a look at the next slide. Oh, oh, that's too much. So the first reaction is that's too much. This is cupping. The issue with this cupping, and these are the typical that you can get these marks, and you know, some people might say it's too much, some people this this might be what they're trying to achieve. But what you can see at the top three middle cups are burns. So these are it states here, dressings were changed every day and the wounds healed in seven days without scarring. This is from a Chinese medical journal um, in relationship to cupping. You just need to be aware that you can burn the patient with cups. Okay? So just following everything properly. The article goes on to mention, I believe that it was due to um, too much alcohol contact with the cups. Right? So these are burns that should not be part of cupping. In relationship to electroacupuncture, do not use with infants, children, incapacitated people, or those with pacemakers. Mm -hmm. Increase the amperage slowly so you make sure the machine is off, you connect your leads, and you slowly turn up the leads, mm -hmm. right? or turn up the amperage, rather. Um, do not cross the body or the brain. Do not do near the brain stem. Do not cross the heart. Right? Do not cross the spine. You want to monitor the patient. Right? It's intended to feel electric stim. You shouldn't feel pain. Right? It's not, the intention is not to have the patient feel pain. You're going to keep the machine dry because, again, you're dealing with an, a, a piece of equipment that you want to make sure is adequately intact and it didn't get wet. Mm -hmm. And it's recommended that you clean the leads. So the alligator clips that you're connecting to the patient's needles, if they do come in contact with the patient or any substance, you want to make sure that you alcohol swab those right, and clean them. Taking a look at the best practices in bleeding therapy. So bleeding therapy, three edge needle, micro bleeding, bloodletting, whatever you, however you call it, um, the recommendation is obviously that you're going to wash your hands and set up a clean field. Now you're going to be penetrating the skin. So for these prior therapies, you didn't need a clean field. For bleeding technique, you need to set up a clean field. You're going to use gloves and eye protection. Because right? now you're going to be breaking the, the skin, which is clear, clean skin. It's, you have to inspect the area prior to penetration. Use sterile lancets. You're not going to be reusing lancets. You're going to discard the lancet in the sharps container. So once you use the lancet, the recommendation is to discard of it immediately. And if you're doing a blood technique, then you go and bloodlet after that to make sure that the sharps is away from you and that you don't potentially poke yourself with it. Know the history of bleeding disorders and medications. Again, just doing an interval history with the patient. Right? If you're going to add a new technique and you, haven't, you did the initial history a year ago, and now you're going to add bleeding, you want to make sure that medications haven't changed, mm -hmm. that nothing has changed, and that it's still a safe technique to perform. 
and only bleed intact skin. How do you think you minimize pain with bleeding technique? Do it quickly. Do it quickly, but when you swab with alcohol, you want to make sure the alcohol is dry. Right? So dried alcohol is going to make sure that the patient doesn't have that extra sting mm -hmm. after the insertion of the lamp set. Best practices in cutaneous needling. This picture here is of seven star or plum blossom needling. You're going to use sterile disposable devices, so they're single use devices. Wear gloves, clean the skin. Again, you have to have that adequate history of the patient, just like with every other treatment. Do not use it on lesions. Do not reuse the device and discard the device in the Sharps container. Okay. Very similar to the bleeding technique. Does anybody have any questions? Do you need to wear gloves when you use incense? I mean, uh, eye, eye shields? Not with this. Not with it's the recommendation is to wear gloves. Thank you. Yeah. Another one. The, um, when you 